Hello and welcome to the second pre-lecture recording for this psychiatry module. Today we'll be talking about depressive disorders. So this is part one of the major depressive disorder lecture. The recommended reading is from DePiro, it's chapter 51. The objectives for this lecture I have broken up into a few different segments. For the pre-lecture recording, we'll focus on the first two. The worksheets that I've posted on Blackboard will focus on the third objective, and our in-class lecture on January 18th will focus on objectives four and five. So for the purposes of this recording, by the end of this uh, lecture recording, you will be able to identify the signs and symptoms of depressive disorders per the DSM-5 criteria, and you'll be able to explain the basic patho pathophysiology and clinical course of major depressive disorder. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual's 5th edition has a long list of different depressive disorders and I've listed here um, the majority of those disorders. Now we won't be focusing on almost, almost all of these uh, but we will be focusing on major depressive disorder which includes major depressive episode. So for major depressive disorder which is abbreviated MDD that is defined as having a period of discrete episodes that meet major depressive episode criteria. So in order to have major depressive disorder, you've had at least one major depressive episode, um, and then you may have recurrent major depressive episodes that amount to the full disorder. So major depressive episode is um, uh, equal to five or more of the following, which are listed below, for at least two weeks. And one of these um, from this list has to be either depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure. So moving on from there, you can also have an unintentional weight gain or loss or an increase or decrease in appetite. Usually I'll just ask patients, has your appetite changed? Um, people will also um, maybe report a ch change in sleep habits, and so they may be reporting that they're sleeping less or that they're sleeping significantly more. So that's another question that I'll ask. I'll just say, how has your sleep changed in the last several weeks? People may report psychomotor agitation, which means they're kind of um, restless and they're amped up and they're kind of moving around more than usual and they're just uneasy. Um, or psychomotor retardation, which means that they've slowed down significantly. They may talk more slowly, genuinely like move more slowly, um, and just in general, everything seems slowed down. People may report fatigue or loss of energy. They may also report feeling worthless or having inaccessive or inappropriate guilt. Um, they may talk about difficulty uh, concentrating or just thinking in general, or that they have a tough time making decisions. And then uh, finally, they may also report recurrent thoughts of death, suicidal ideation, or they may have had a suicide attempt. It's important to distinguish that these recurrent thoughts of death are not just a, a person being afraid of dying, but that they are frequently thinking about, well, what if they did die? How would they do it? Um, what would put, be put into that? Those kinds of things. And um, again, one of the most important things to remember with any of these psychiatric disorders, um, the, the patient, while they have to meet all of these criteria, they also have to have clinically significant distress or this has to impair their social and or occupational functioning. So there's a mnemonic to remember uh, most of the signs and symptoms of major depression, and that's SIGI caps. Lots of people learn this mnemonic in order to help them remember what kinds of symptoms uh, people have in order to meet major depressive episode criteria. So S stands for sleep, and that's a sleep change. I stands for interest, so that's that their interest has been reduced. That's also known as anhedonia. G stands for guilt, like we talked about, excessive or inappropriate guilt. E stands for energy in that it is reduced. C stands for concentration in that their concentration is more difficult lately. A stands for affect, and affect is um, an objective measure of a person's mood. So when we talk about somebody's mood, we'll say, how's your mood been? And maybe they'll say, okay, or fine, or I've been feeling happy, or I've been feeling sad. Whereas their affect is how we decide to assess their mood. And so their affect should be depressed. P is psychomotor agitation or retardation, um, and that's like we talked about, either that um, amping up or slowing down, and S is suicidal thoughts or attempts. When we're talking about depression, it's important to be able to distinguish major depressive episode from grief. Um, 
people may experience all of the major depressive disorder symptoms when they're going through a period of significant loss. It's important for us to realize that loss doesn't always just mean that somebody has died. While that can be certainly um, a reason for somebody to be experiencing grief, they may also be experiencing grief for reasons like they've gone through financial ruin, um, they've had a significant loss from a natural disaster, maybe they've lost their home. Um, they um, have just learned that they have a new diagnosis, it's a serious illness or a disability, and so they're kind of losing the life that they once had. Clinical judgment is, is required to make this diagnosis. It's um, This is not the kind of thing where you can read a case um, on paper and say, well, no, that's just grief. You have to meet the person, maybe get to know them for a little while, and then be able to distinguish whether or not the person's actually just grieving um, or if they've started to develop a major depressive disorder. The estimated prevalence for depression is somewhere between 13 and 16 percent. There are a variety of risk factors. Some of those are female gender, first degree relative with depression. Um, so depression does, it does have some biological component to it. Uh, people who have been widowed are separated or are divorced. People with low income, unemployment, physical disability, or people with a history of trauma or a vulnerability to stress are all at increased risk for experiencing depression. <clears throat> people who have depression at a given time are at increased risk for developing medical illnesses as well as other psychiatric or substance use disorders. As far as the burden of MDD goes, it's really um, a shame that there is a significant underdiagnosis and suboptimal treatment kind of uh, across the board. Only about half of patients with major depressive disorder will seek mental illness care at all. This is kind of attributed to limited access, um, certain cultural beliefs. Maybe somebody, you know, sometimes um, we'll see this with the male gender where um, guys tend to think that they, they can handle it, that they need to be tough and that they shouldn't, um, you know, tell people about their feelings. And then they kind of end up suffering a lot more in the long run. Um, and certainly other cultures may have varying um, perspectives on how they're supposed to address their, their mood and emotions. There's also certainly a, a substantial negative stigma that corresponds with depression and um, people are, are afraid to seek care because they don't want to face that stigma. Only about one in five patients with depression report receiving adequate treatment, which is absolutely a shame. 20% of people, so 80% of people with depression say that they don't feel like their treatment is um, adequate enough. Depression is corresponded to or corresponds to significant high costs. The cost uh, associated with just lost productivity, so that's um, because people are calling in sick for work or so on and so forth, is over $50 billion. And then treatment costs are over $20 billion, and so those are direct costs of major depressive disorder. So for the etiology and pathophysiology, there are certainly some brain structure ab structural abnormalities that have been identified in people with major depressive disorder. The amygdala and the hippocampus have been found to be overactive, but that they shrink with each bout of depression. The uh, lateral ventricles are enlarged, which corresponds to a reduction in gray matter or brain matter. So the brain is having more difficulty processing things when there isn't the appropriate amount of matter present. There's a smaller caudate and putamen. And um, there's also altered activity of the prefrontal cortex, which we know is um, significantly involved with logical thought and um, the ability to make decisions and executive functioning. And so when people are depressed, they actually have reduced ability to make decisions and plan things out. There's also substantial neurotransmitter involvement, and this is broken up into two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is the monoamine hypothesis, and um, which it's in a, it's a historic discovery that um, depletion of certain neurotransmitters leads to depression. So they did find this out that if we do decrease serotonin, which again is abbreviated as 5-HT, norepinephrine, and dopamine, then that leads to depression. And we find that if we replace those neurotransmitters. Um, and increase their availability, then symptoms do improve. What isn't explained by this hypothesis, though, is that we have a delayed onset. So if we start, um, delayed onset of effect once we start antidepressants. So when we start antidepressants to try to improve these neurotransmitters, 
it takes still upwards of four, six, or eight weeks before patients start actually feeling better. And so it doesn't make that much sense that if it's only about repleting the uh, these neurotransmitters, um, that they should start they should start feeling better very very quickly. And when we see that they don't, then this hypothesis doesn't really um, explain all of that. And that's where the dysregulation hypothesis comes in. And the dysregulation hypothesis says that depression is due to dysregulated neurotransmitters emitters causing pre and post synaptic are causing altered pre and post synaptic receptors. And so if we were to look at this, um, we have the, the efferent neuron coming in and the afferent neuron coming out, and we have the synapse right here. So we would imagine that presynaptic receptors would be somewhere along the edges of this uh, neuron. And then we have the postsynaptic receptors that we can see. And so if these receptors are altered, then perhaps the neurons can't actually respond appropriately to um, increased levels of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. What we see is that receptors start to normalize after um, antidepressant treatment, but that that normalization is delayed. And so this kind of um, it does explain that delayed response when people start antidepressant treatment. And so the way that we kind of think about this is someone starts, um, let's say, Prozac, which is thought to increase serotonin availability within the brain. And so while the brain has increased levels of serotonin, it takes a while for the receptors to respond to those increased levels of serotonin and to um, start to create more receptors on the um, presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. Um, and so once those receptors, however, are normalized again, then the brain starts to respond more appropriately to the increased levels of serotonin and people start feeling better. And this is thought to take um, about four to eight weeks to occur. And then the final um, contribution to depression um, etiology is the chronic stress model. And so that is to say that stress causes an increase in the concentration of substance P, which is a very painful substance. And so when people are depressed, they feel more pain, which also makes them more depressed. And we kind of create a vicious cycle that way. But stress also increases um, or causes the HPA access to secrete glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids and cortisol. This then decreases brain-derived neurotropic factor, which decreases neurogenesis in the hippocampus. And so they found that in animal models, if you add an antidepressant, you can actually block that decreased neurogenesis in the hippocampus and start to recover some of that negative um, physiology that occurs when we have these increased levels of stress. Again, this has not been demonstrated in humans. It's only been demonstrated in animals but it is thought to be a contributing factor to depression. So for the clinical course, we don't need to get into the details here, but if we were to imagine how um, the clinical course of somebody who gets treated for depression looks, it's somewhat like this graph. And so on the y-axis, we have increasing severity, x-axis is time. People typically start out um, euthymic, and that means that their mood is stable and normal. Um, and not particularly high, not particularly low. And then we have an onset of symptoms and they start to progress and then they become a syndrome. And once treatment is started, that's called the acute phase of treatment. That's between six and 12 weeks of uh, treatment. And let's just say that that treatment is an antidepressant. Then they start to have an um, improvement in mood. And once about 50% of their symptoms have resolved, that's called a response. And then their mood continues to improve, and once it's back to normal, that's called remission. And after about a year of improved mood, they're then in recovery. People can relapse at any time before recovery, and then after a year of improved mood back to normal um, with no relapses, um, if they do have uh, symptoms come back, that's called a recurrence. I won't test you on these vocabulary terms. Um, as far as the timing goes and over the treatment course of MDD. For um, the onset of major depressive disorder, um, most people experience their first major depressive episode kind of throughout their life, but the average age of onset is within the late 20s. 
Symptoms can develop over days to weeks or all of a sudden. Typically the ones, um, the major depressive episodes that occur suddenly have occurred after a life stressor. So loss of a job, uh, significant breakup, divorce, um, various things you can imagine that would cause uh, someone to feel down and then the symptoms kind of just cascade from there. As for duration, it typically takes somewhere between four and five months for somebody's depression, uh, major depressive episode to resolve or to get into recovery, and that is with treatment. If somebody goes untreated, it could take six months or significantly longer than that, up to years. Functioning typically goes back to baseline between episodes, um, between the major depressive episodes. And um, it's important for us to remember that these major, major depressive disorder is this kind of series of, of waxing and waning symptoms. And so there are periods of time where people will be fully functioning and feel relatively normal and then their symptoms come back. And so you can imagine, I'll show you a graph on the next slide where people's symptoms are kind of fine and then they go down and worsen and then they're fine again and then they go down and worsen. And the pattern that is shown with people with major depressive disorder is called kindling. And what kindling means is that the periods of remission are usually longer earlier on in the disease and that the course of illness is less severe earlier on in the disease. And then as major depression progresses, the remission periods start to decrease in time and the actual episodes of depression start to worsen and become more severe. About 20 to 35 percent of people only ever achieve partial remission and unfortunately about 15 percent never achieve remission at all. So this is uh, just to show you what the kindling effect means and so um, like I said again with the um, as you go down the y-axis, you have increasing symptom severity and the x-axis is time. So early on in the disease, you have bigger periods of remission, longer periods of stable mood, and less severe episodes of major depression. And then as you go on over time and the, and the disease progresses, the symptoms get worse and much more frequent. There's significant recurrence risk with major depressive disorder. Only about uh, half of patients who have, are treated recover without, um, without recurrence at all. There are certainly risk factors for recurrence for patients who have what we call comorbid dysthymia. And what that means is that um, dysthymia is kind of like depression, but it's less severe. And so they're just dysthymic all the time. They're kind of mildly a little bit depressed all the time. But then they can have a major depressive episode on top of that where they are severely depressed, and that's called double depression. People who have concurrent medical conditions are at increased risk of having a major depressive episode recurrence, and people who have psychiatric comorbidities are also at increased risk. Unfortunately, the risk increases with the number of previous episodes. So half of patients with one prior episode are at um, risk of recurrence or are likely going to have a recurrence. Up to 70% of people with two prior episodes are going to recur, and 90% of people with at least three prior episodes are going to recur, which is basically to say that almost everybody who's had at least three prior episodes is going to have another episode of major depressive depression. We can't talk about the clinical course of major depression without talking about suicide. It's un unfortunate, but uh, up to 20% of people with major depressive disorder have a lifetime risk of suicide and that risk increases with each recurring episode of major depression. So there's a mnemonic to help remember the risk factors or, or the um, kind of warning signs to think of um, for patients at risk of suicide. I stands for, or I'm sorry, it's, the mnemonic is, is path warm. I stands for ideation, and that's just the thought that somebody is ha thinking of, of death, thinking about suicide. S stands for substance use, so if they're drinking a lot or they're starting to use other substances, that's a warning sign especially because when they're under the influence, they're more likely to attempt suicide while they're intoxicated. P stands for purposelessness. Somebody starts saying, I don't have any purpose in life anymore. Um, A stands for anxiety. Sometimes people have a very anxious depression and that increases their risk of suicide. T stands for a trapped feeling and that's as if somebody feels like they're stuck where they are and they can't get out or they can't get out of their certain situation. H is for hopelessness. W is for withdrawal, and that means social withdrawal. So they're socially isolating. They're not calling their friends and family anymore. They're not really going out to meet people, and they're not doing as much as maybe they used to do. 
A stands for anger. R stands for recklessness. Maybe they're driving more quickly or they're doing things that are relatively dangerous and not normal for them. And M stands for mood change, and that's intended to mean a dramatic mood change. So maybe they've been depressed, but um, if they all of a sudden look like they're in really good shape and they're feeling really, really well out of nowhere, that's actually a, a risk factor for suicide. Um, or if they were moderately depressed and then they seem significantly more depressed than um, very suddenly, then that's another risk factor. And so it's important for us to be able to screen for suicide. If somebody starts telling you that they're feeling low, that their mood is being is worse lately, it's really important that we ask um, about suicidal thoughts. And it's also important to know that asking about suicidal ideation does not increase suicide risk. So just some examples of questions to ask. Have you been feeling hopeless? Have you been having thoughts of harming yourself or that life is not worth living? Or have you been thinking about how you might do it? So on that note, that concludes the pre-lecture recording for the depression lecture. And I look forward to continuing this lecture um, on the 18th of January. And please don't forget to complete the pre-lecture worksheets uh, once you get to that point.